Thank you. Thanks for everybody for coming tonight. We're going to uh, do a short exhortation on who we are as the body of Christ in healing. And I just want to go through that with no interruptions, please. Because we want to get to the point where we're going to lay hands on people for healing tonight. And I feel that the Lord has been prompting me and it's been confirmed from two or three different ways. And I went to my pastor about it and told him what I wanted to do and he said it was fine. Um, I think we're going to, um, I think the Lord wants to have a healing service as a regular part of Wednesday night. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll know the tree by its fruit. If it produces fruit, we'll continue on, keep on doing it. If it was just the pepperoni pizza I ate last night, we'll stop. You know, so we want to do what he wants. Um, one of my mentors, Michelle Carell, is over in Kenya right now doing a, a pastor's uh, anointing and fire conference. And I, I saw some of her live stream preaching. And she's very, very on fire right now. And what, we, what she was saying to these pastors in Kenya was, God is inviting us and making the grace available with our cooperation. We always have a part of it. We, got, you know, our, we have a free will. We have to make the decision ourselves. I can only make the decision for myself. I can't make it for you. You can't make it for me. That's the way God created it. What he wants us to do is he wants us to make the Holy Spirit the absolute focus of our lives. He, he wants to make us, give us the understanding that the, the presence of the Holy Spirit, when Jesus said, it's better that I go, if I don't go, the Spirit can't come. It's got to be pretty, the Spirit, Spirit's got to be pretty important if he says, better that I go. But he's the, that's the pearl of great price. That, that's why we need to start to move into a body ministry, a prophetic ministry, that hears what God is saying, and we simply do what he's telling us to do. It might be the simplest thing on the face of the earth. It might be something a little bit bigger. doesn't matter. Whatever he says, we do. That's what Mama Mary said, didn't she say? Do whatever he tells you? Well, how are you going to do what he tells you if you can't hear him? So how do you hear him? You ask the Lord, I, I need to hear you. Could you please make me understand when you're speaking to me and give me the grace to take some prayer time so that I can make myself available to you to do whatever you want? So it's, it's very, very simple in application. It's very difficult to surrender. That's, that's the hard part. Um, The thing that's been, I've been hearing from many segments of the body of Christ that I listen to is God comes to us and saves us as individuals, absolutely. He's a personal savior, but he's not my private savior. He's my personal savior in the midst of a community. He's our savior, okay? It's a community. And we're all members of the body of Christ. By baptisms, we're, we're members of the body of Christ. When somebody comes to accept the Lord as an adult, what was made for most of us as children, there are promises made for us. And St. Louis de Montfort says, this is what, what, what's the great failing of virtually all Christians from being true to their baptismal promises is because we haven't ratified those. It's like we've been offered it, and once we start to be able to have reason and think and make our decisions consciously, that's the time when, you know, I should have the confirmation, but most, it, most aren't really ready for it at that point, I don't think. Could be. It's got. It's not. It's not got nothing to do with age. I see. I know some young people that are so sold out to the Lord and so prayerful. They make me jealous. It take me a long time to get to the point where I am. They just simply got there earlier. But that's got. It's got nothing to do. It's like the guy that went out out in the morning and worked, and the guy that went out at, the, at five o'clock and worked, and God gave him the same wage. You know, and the first guy was like PO'd about the whole thing. I worked all day and I got this thing, and this guy went out for an hour and he got it. That's not the way we need to look at it, because that's the way the world looks at things. They look at them in, in, in a competitive way. You know, I, I, I studied personal development for a long time, and one of the guys had recommended this book. It was called The Science of Getting Rich by Wall Swaddles. It was, it was written in the early part of the 1900s. And one of the images he had says that uh, most people function, if they want a bigger piece of the pie, you have to have a smaller piece of the pie, okay? In God's economy, if you want a bigger piece of the pie, you just ask God to make a bigger pie. Amen. Right? His is the silver and the gold. His is the cattle on a thousand hills. Now, I know that's, a, that's an image. What that says to me is all wealth and treasury 
is in the heart of God. But the scripture says the full treasury of grace has been poured out of Christ's heart already. It's already poured out. It's already poured out. See, I don't have to beg God to do something. I have to ask him to make me receive what he's already poured out. God, when he, Jesus on the cross, he said, it's done, it's finished. Now, he didn't have to go into the tomb and rise, and he had to ascend into heaven, and he had to be seated at the right hand of the Father. He had to receive the gift of the Spirit from the Father, and then he sent them upon the face of the earth. That was the completion of that whole thing. That was his total passion. But the Holy Spirit has been poured out. And the Holy Spirit, if we've been baptized, came into our souls in a miracle of grace trans translated us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. But if we haven't, a lot of people, even though they know the words and they can even say Jesus is Lord, maybe they, they've asked him in their heart, which is a very important and wonderful thing. But the gift to live that life is a mystery to them. Because that's what the Holy Spirit does. And the Holy Spirit is like a gift that we've got been given at baptism. We put it on a shelf in the closet and we just never gotten around to unwrapping it. Okay? But he, he, at this time, he's always ready to help us to unwrap that. But it's very important that we unwrap it right now because I don't know if you live in the same world I do. It's a mess. But that's okay. Because the God's not asleep at the switch. Even though the power from below has been unleashed, the power from on high is infinitely better. And people have this idea, they're sort of looking at things and they say, is good going to win or is evil going to win? Good's already won. The scripture tells me that Jesus took all the weapons from Satan and his cohorts and stripped them of all their weapons and paraded them for the universe in shame. But the Father, for some reason, has given them two things that Satan can do, still do. He can try and deceive us by putting thoughts into our minds that are not God's, and that's going to run us down a very dark alley because he just wants to destroy us. We, don't, we, have to, we have to take every thought captive in obedience to Christ. And he also, um, he accuses us day and night before the throne. I don't know why the God and the Father's letting him do that. Somehow, you know, it's his plan. God does a lot of things I wouldn't have done that way. You know? Jesus said I could have called down ten legions of angels and stopped this thing going on, and he didn't. If I could have done it, I probably would have. <laughs> you know? But that's me. That's the flesh. He came to do the Father's will. And that's what we need to do is to be absorbed into the Father's will and not be afraid of what he's doing. Because some of it is very deep. And what happens is, is because all of us are broken. All of us are wounded by one way or another. I mean, we've all had parents. Obviously, we're here because we had parents. And in my family, I got a lot of great things that passed down my family line, but I got a lot of really dumb things that came down my family line too. You know, as I told you a hundred million times, my mother's side had all PhDs in worry and anxiety. And I, I saw what that did to them. Now, a lot of them got baptized in the Spirit and got past that. In my life, it, I don't think it took as great a hold as it had on some of them, but it took a hold. It took me a long time to figure out, by God's grace, to have a strategy by being obedient, obedient to His Word, that when difficulties come, when trials come, which they come to all of us, don't they? Yes. And God says, through James, count it pure joy, brothers and sisters, when every trial comes your way. And when I heard that 50-something years ago, I scratched my head and I said, I, that, what is it? that doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. What I've learned all well, these many years is when those things come, it's almost like, and this is my just interpretation, this is not doctrine of the church or anything, but my interpretation, when troubles come, it's like God is putting us into a timeout so that I, in, in, in my view of him, he's not letting me go down the next cliff. He's, he's keeping my attention fixed on something so that I can turn to him deeper than I've ever turned to him. That's why I can count it pure joy. Because when the troubles come, and it's like Brother David Petroli, you know, he's, he's, I saw him yesterday in the hospital. He had two stents put in. He's doing well. He's going to have a pacemaker tomorrow, and they might release him. From six days ago when he passed out and he had a heart attack, and 30 seconds later, uh, registered, a registered nurse walked in the door and started giving him CPR until the squad came. Now, if that ain't God, I don't know what is. He had it all prepared. Now, he didn't make David have a heart attack. You know, that was, could be a, a zillion different things. It could be strictly physical. It could be spiritual, physical. Who knows? It could be emotional, spiritual, physical. A lot of stress, whatever. Uh, maybe he, anyway, we don't know why that happened. But God had a solution. And he was in an induced coma for two days. I went to see him while he was still in the coma. The nurse 
who was tending to him was a male nurse, and he was fixing, he was, he was, you know, they had him all chilled down to like 32 degrees, and he was in an induced coma, and they had all these things, and he was intubated. And I, and I told the nurse who I was, and the guy said, yeah, I'm just doing these, it, don't bother, it won't bother me, go over if you want to pray with him, pray with him. So I went over and prayed with him, and I just started, I, I encouraged him, I told him, I said, make sure you got your shelton clothes on, because you're coming out of this, buddy, you're going to need them. We got our shelton clothes on. I said, you're going to live and you're not going to die. And uh, I closed my eyes and just was praying in the spirit. I opened my eyes and just for a very brief second, I just saw glory all around and I knew that he was going to be okay. Now, glory is going to be around when we die, but glory is also around us when we're going to live. And we have to learn and understand, this is what Michelle was teaching in, in Kenya this last couple of days, we have to hear what God is saying and, and do that. And I think the time is here in the church that he's making all these graces available. So just a couple ideas before we actually pray. First of all, I, you know, I've been reading some things where I get from this, uh, 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 this exorcist that, that posts things, uh, my senior Rosetti. Uh, he, was, he was talking about, it's called the Temple of the Holy Spirit. And, he was, and he's, he's a, 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 a seasoned exorcist in league with other exorcists. He does a thing on the internet that thousands of people listen to and he prays for healing and deliverance. And he also puts out this little diary every, every week. I was praying over a demonically afflicted person. I got into the phase in the final imperative prayer where it says, acknowledge the spirit of truth and grace who repels your attacks and confounds your lies. Shortly thereafter, it says, depart from this man or woman whom by spiritual anointing of God has made a holy temple. The demonic action was very strong. Obviously, it hit a nerve. So I emphasize this the theological truth. I command you in the name of Jesus to open your eyes and see that he is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And again, I pray, the Holy Spirit dwells with him. There is no room for you. The light of the Spirit casts out the darkness. Another of our exorcists had the same experience. He too in his exorcism session hammers home the truth. He or she is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The pneumatic aspect pertaining to the Holy Spirit of the new rite of exorcism is a powerful addition. It only makes sense. The incarnation of the Son of God enabled our humanity to be filled with the Holy Spirit and participate in the divine life. This did not happen to angels. It is speculated that one of the reasons Lucifer rejected God was his envy of humanity. See, I had that same understanding a few years ago. I think the thing that made him, who was a worship leader in heaven, just couldn't bear it anymore because he knew what he was going to do to men and women, creatures. Created a little less than the angels, but he was going to share the divine nature with us. You understand, our calling is so terribly immense, and yet we go through, and many people go through life, fearful, anxious, afraid, wringing their hands, they don't know what to do, and I understand all that. And uh, we had an old business adage, adage that said, if you don't know what to do, you tend to do nothing. But the scriptures tell us what to do. So Jesus said, if you don't want to mis be misled, know the scriptures and the power of God. So we need to avail ourselves to the scriptures and meditate upon them. There's truth. And it needs to go from here down into our spirits. It, it's great if you got a good intellect. You know, I, as I said, I've got four kids. They all went to, to college, master's and doctorate degrees. And that's wonderful. They applied themselves. They studied hard. Our young brother over here is going, he's in school right now for an advanced degree. He's got the ability. And he, it takes effort, right? I mean, it just doesn't happen. You just, they just don't give it to you. You've got to work for it. Sharon's a nurse. Mary's a nurse. They keep going through these things to, to achieve that stuff. But all of that gets enlightened from, the, from our spirit united with the Holy Spirit that, that, that informs the intellect about truth. See, we can't get to God through just our mind, but our mind is part of it. Okay, we have to, we have to be healed and renewed in the spirit of our mind. So, what are, the, what are the ways that we bring about healing? Well, I won't go into the whole thing. I did a, a series a couple of years ago. It's on my YouTube channel of, of two nights of teaching about healing. There's lots of different ways. Doctor, psychologists, and stuff like that, they're part of it, absolutely. Uh, the sacrament of the sick is part of it. Uh, herbs and, and medicines are part of it. And, 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 and you know, he, divine healing is part of it too. And so we can participate in that for only one reason. In, 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 the, uh, uh, in the gospel, uh, 
of Mark 16, it says, these signs will follow those that believe they'll lay their hands on the sick and they'll recover. So he wasn't talking about people with the gift of healing. He wasn't talking about ordained clergy, and that's fine, and they've got their gifts and they should be utilizing them. I can't do the anointing of the sick, a priest can do that. But we can pray healing for one another because we, what? Believe. That's the only qualification. These signs will follow those that believe. You believe, brothers and sisters? Amen. Okay. I, well, I think we, you know, we have a belief. It's a gift to have the belief. It's, we didn't come up with it on our own. God gave us the grace to begin to believe. And, and belief is a journey. Remember the guy in, 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 the, in the scriptures that wanted Jesus to heal his son? And he sort of questioned Jesus a little bit if he, you know, if he, wanted, if, if he can heal him. And Jesus said, well, I want to heal him. And the guy, the guy said, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. So he was being honest with God. And that's the only thing God requires of us, is just to be who we are, tell him what we need, what we want, the questions we've got. He's, he's not surprised by any of them. Tell him the stuff that we did wrong, that we, we think again about, we want to repent. Not that he doesn't know him, he knows him. But he says, if you'll confess your sins, I'll be faithful to forgive him. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? I mean, maybe none of you had, have ever had anything you needed to confess. <laughs> uh, Brian and I have. <laughs> I think just something does too. But anyway, uh, so the thing is, is we, we want to make it a body ministry. You know, what Michelle was saying to those people over in Kenya, when they start, the, the spirit was falling on them and the anointing was falling and she started to minister, and she says, I need everybody's help here. Pray, pray in the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit, she said, is not depending on Michelle Carell. The Holy Spirit is not depending on Frank when Chet and I ministered together. Well, he said, this isn't the Frank and Chet show, this is the Holy Spirit show. And we try to get out of his way the best we can possibly get out of his way. Sometimes we got in his way, like we all do. But he's asking us right now to ask for the grace to keep out of his way. My senior Esif, who I was privileged to get spiritual direction to for, I don't know, for about 20 years, he was a confessor to Mother Teresa and a spiritual, and, a, and he did retreats for her sisters. He told me one time, I asked Mother Teresa when I was with her one time, says, Mother, how can I pray for you? And she said, pray that I don't get in this way. She knew it wasn't her. I mean, she was doing and doing her part, but she knew it wasn't her. If we lay hands on, on people and they're healed, it's not because we have some kind of inherent goodness about ourselves. We're members of the body of Christ. So what we want to do always is accept Every day is fresh. I don't know about you. It says, his mercy is renewed every morning. And I think it's a great thing we get to sleep because if we didn't get to sleep, we'd be carrying all that stuff. Sometimes we just forget about our problems overnight. We let them start again in the morning, okay? But his mercy is renewed every morning. So I think it's important every day, unless you're in the place already where you love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. Now, I know we do it with some of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We wouldn't be here, or we wouldn't be going to church, or we wouldn't be considering the things to do, or we wouldn't be doing good works and helping poor people. He's got to be at work with us to do that. But if you, if you can just agree that there's probably more of my heart, my soul, my strength, that I can surrender to him so that I can grow in him. In other words, I can grow in him and he can grow in me. Like the Baptist said, I've got to decrease and he's got to increase. Okay? So when we come together, we should always, in our communal prayer, in our liturgical prayer, and in our prayer closet, that little place where we go and it's just us and, and, and the Trinity and we talk to him, uh, we have to <coughs> place ourselves and we have to invite him in afresh every day. I, I don't know how you do it. That's the whole concept of the Catholics, you know, the, thing, the morning offering. There's many forms of it. Direction for our times has a, a beautiful morning offering watch. I make part of my my morning offering. But my first thing is addressing the Holy Spirit because Jesus said, "Seek first the kingdom, and all these other things will be given to you." And one of the saints said, "When the Lord spoke of the kingdom, He was speaking about the presence of the Holy Spirit." So before I do anything else, and I do a little bit of a surrender and morning offering before I go into what I feel is God's command to me to do an hour in tongues in the morning. I say, Holy Spirit, soul of my soul, I adore thee. 
Enlighten, guide, strengthen, and console me. Tell me what to do. Command me to do it. I promise to be submissive in everything you've asked of me and accept all you permit to happen to me. Only show me what is your will. And then when things happen in the day and I start kicking against the goat and I don't want to do it, I said to myself, remember what you said this morning? I'll accept everything you permit to happen to me. I ain't doing such a good job about that right now. <laughs> Lord, could you come and help the boy now? Okay, it, once I realized that, I used to just barrel through it and keep on doing whatever I wanted to do, okay? And sometimes I did that for decades on end. And I, and I, I reaped the rewards of that. But now he's making me more aware when I get stuck like that. I used to say, call a hard time out and call upon God to give you the grace to surrender to him. And I think that's still a, a very big part of it. But when I, when I heard a few weeks ago that the real meaning of Psalm 46 where it says, be still and know that I am God, in Hebrew, that word be still means to drop your weapons. That means when I get to that point and I'm stuck and all my flesh starts to get riled up and I want to take I want to figure it out and I want to control it and I want to get ahead of Jesus on there, I just say to him, not once, not twice, but probably a dozen of them, two dozen times a day, Lord, I drop my weapons. I, I'm, the battle is yours. Even though I let you in on a lot of the battle and, and said you could be defend me on this, there's certain things over here that I sort of want to take care of myself. Now, I don't know if I, you can relate to that at all, but I'll tell you what, that's about as foolish as I could be, and I've been foolish. But and what, is a fool, what, is a, what does a fool mean? What, is, what does the scripture say? What, is, what, what Why does the scripture define fool? Does anybody know from the scriptures? A fool says in his heart there is no God. Okay. What we're really saying at that point is there is no master of the universe. There is no Lord of life. There's me trying to be a God. Okay? And that doesn't work out too well. Now, if you want to do that, he'll let you do that till the cows come home. Because he's not going to interrupt our free will. But he'll put circumstances and teachings and people and casual conversations and things that things you might even hear on television or on the internet that are going to make us understand a little bit more deeply how not only important it is to surrender to God, but how we can ask him for the grace to do that, because I don't know how to surrender. I mean, he's taught me some strategies to help me, but it's grace. Even, the, even understanding that it means drop your weapons was a whole just blob of mercy that fell on me that helped me. I don't know if you ever had mercy just fall on you and understood something where you could just sort of get some of the weight off your shoulders. You know, I've had that happen several times in my life where I got weight off my shoulders and I got more weight off my shoulders and I got more weight off my shoulders. And I was in a, I had to do some dental work and I was finally over with but I had to do, there was a long thing, I had to get a, a, an implant and one too. It was a month long thing. And I told them the last time, I, was, I, I got, finally got this thing Completed today, but last time I said, you know, my, my mouth really was, of all the stuff you've done, well, you did a lot of stuff, I said, it was sores. He says, well, that's because your, your jaw keeps on wanting to clamp up. And I said, why? He says, you just got to get rid of stress. <laughs> it's a natural physiological reaction. Your jaw is just trying to close. I'm trying to work in there, and I'm trying to hold it open, and you're trying to close. You don't even know you're doing it. I says, what are you, a psychiatrist too? He says, no, but it's, it's true, and I'm telling you. And so, I had to say to myself, well, Lord, you got to show me where I'm allowing this to build up in myself. I'm not even aware of it. I'm not, I don't think I'm as tense as I used to be, but I, I probably am still some tense. It's showing, you can't, the body doesn't lie. Okay? So anyway, we're always learning things about ourselves. I never thought I would hear that from my dentist to point out to me, you know, you got something to, to, to pray about over here, bud. See, all it's about giving us something to pray about. They ask the Lord. So, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes in the heart and is so justified and confesses with the mouth and so is saved. So, there, there's a real good practical reason to have people invite Jesus into their hearts. And if you've done it a thousand times, or in my case, it's 78 years times 365 times how many days, you know, all those times where I needed to do it, I still didn't need to do it one more time today. 
If today I hear his voice, I'm not supposed to harden my heart. So when we're going to go about this, and this is the way I see the healing ministry sort of unfolding, I mean, it's been, it's been pointing in this direction for a really, really long time. You know, Mother Nadine said when, before she prayed for anybody, she always asked them to just surrender to the Lord and, and ask them to, to be, be filled afresh with the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is a continuous, ongoing tense. Remember, he, in, in Greek, in, in where it says, uh, don't be drunk on wine, be filled with the Spirit. In Greek, it's a continuous, ongoing tense. It means be being filled. It's a continuous action. That's why it's called the river. It flows. Okay? So, um, I have the Holy Spirit. The, yes. For a long, long time, the Holy Spirit didn't have me hardly at all. Then he did something in my life where I realized I needed him and I surrendered to him. And I thought it was really great, and it was really great, but I didn't realize I had so far to go. But he stayed with me, and he's still staying with me. And he, I, I believe in his love so much right now that even when I find some more of my deep brokenness, some of the stuff that's still hidden from my conscious mind, still down in my subconscious someplace, locked in the spirit, I, I used to be worried, anxious, and fearful, and, and ashamed of all that stuff, but now I'm just saying, thank you, Daddy God, because you just showed me something more that you want to heal me of. So it's all good. Count it pure joy, brothers and sisters, and every trial comes your way. You understand? I don't know what you're going through. We're all going through stuff. I don't know anybody that's not. But if we can get to the point where we allow God to bring us to that point by his mercy and grace, and remember, Scripture has this great saying that says it's all grace. So we really can't take credit for anything except for, like Mary said, yes. And that changed all of history. Okay? When we say yes, it changes all of history. Maybe not to the extent that Mary's yes said it, because that was the most profound yes and started a whole bunch of stuff. Okay? But our yes is going to mean something to the, in our families and to the people around us. And to us. We work our own salvation up with fair and drumming. So the thing is, is we're in this as a collaboration. We're in this together as a body. We're not in competition. Okay? We should be encouraging, upbuilding, and consoling one another. So just to, to say that thing in Mark, to read it, these signs will accompany, accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak new languages. They will pick up servants with their hands. And if they drink anything deadly, it won't harm them. And there's lots of meanings to that. They will lay their hands on their sick, and they will recover. <clears throat> That's pretty straightforward. Now in Romans it says, For as in one body we have many parts, and all the parts do not have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually parts of one another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us exercise them, if prophecy, in proportion to the faith, to our faith, if ministry, in ministry. If one is a teacher in teaching, if one exhorts in exhortation, if one contributes in generosity, if one is over others with diligence, if one does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So it's just showing we've all got different parts. And so I'm, I'm seeing that the fruitfulness of any ministry, see, I think, we're, I think what God is, too much stuff has happened where we've gone places and heard truth and probably were blessed and maybe received some grace but we still were in the category of like spectators we came to be you know some people go to church because the music is beautiful well, it's good that the music is beautiful but that's not the real reason to go it's great that it's it, it, it's wonderful if, it's, if the preaching is great wonderful okay if they if they put on great banquets wonderful the CCF cushions on wonderful. But it's not the purpose. Why do we come? We come to adore the Lord, be in his presence, and say, as Catholics, I'm going to receive you, body and blood, soul and divinity. You're going to come within my being, and you're going to give me the grace to surrender to you actually living within me. Not just like a type of Jesus, just not like the dollar store version of Jesus, but Jesus. Well, Paul could say, I no longer live, but Christ lives within me. And if God's not a respecter of persons, he can do it for each one of us. Now, I know we're all at different places, and we're not in competition. 
I might be a step ahead of you, you might be a step ahead of me, but it doesn't matter. We're on the same road going together, okay? We need to encourage one another to keep on going. So, in Corinthians 12, as a body is one, though it has many parts, and all the parts of the body, though many, are one body, also in Christ. For in one spirit you were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or persons, male or female. All of us were given to drink of one spirit. Now the body is not a single part, but many. So if we're serious about uh, wanting to reach out and see people healed, and I, I think all of us probably would say, yeah, I really would like to see that. I'd like to, I'd like to see the society transform. Now, will we care for everybody from in the womb and out of the womb? Will we care for people that are hungry and sick in, in jail? You know, in the United States, we've made a, just a huge, huge business out of jail. Now, I don't say we don't need jails, but I'm telling you, a lot of things are done to keep the jails full, and they make a lot of money. So, you know, it's a love of money always is the root of all evil. And I'm not saying you don't need jails. At this point, we probably need jails. Uh, but when uh, uh, Pope John the Twenty Third, at one point I think he was he was he was a priest or a, I don't think he was a bishop yet. But anyway, he he got somebody mad at him and they sent him off to this village way up in the Alps, sort of just sort of like a banishment. And he, he found this he found this little town that uh, this was like uh, right after. Uh, I think the end of the Second World War. And uh, the story was that at one point this lady came into town full of light. And he, he believed there was the Blessed Virgin making an apparition or a visitation there. And after that had the effect in that village, they had to close down the jails because there was nobody who needed to go to jail. They didn't need a hospital because nobody was getting sick. It, it was a foretaste of heaven. It was, a, I think, it was an example of what could happen. And when those things happen, Mary's always there. I mean, it's just, it's, it's just, you know, it's just part of it. Now, if we want to be good children of Mary, we're going to do the same thing she did. We're going to let it be done unto us according to His Word, and we're going to do whatever He tells us to do. And so I'm just telling you, we need to start asking God for the grace to hear him give us directions. I mean, Monsignor Rasif, who was one of the most, probably the most amazing person I've ever met on the face of the earth. He'd get so granular with listening to the listening to God. One time he was saying, I was, at the, I was preaching this retreat and I, I got done with the, the talk and I, you know, I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? He says, I want you to go to the cafeteria. And so he went to the cafeteria. He says, Lord, do you want you, what do you want me to do? He says, I want you to eat an orange. So he ate an orange. That's how granular he was. Okay. Now, I still don't ask him in the morning when I get up with a pair of socks. I still choose the socks, but maybe he has a preference. I don't know. But the, the point is, if we get into the habit of asking him about stuff, Lord, would you lead me in all the things that are important? You know, if you need me to tell me what color socks put on, I'm willing to stop and listen to that. I, 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 I'm not right there yet, and I don't know if I'll ever right be there, but I tell you what, when I go and I want to go someplace, I ask him, do you want me to go there? And sometimes he just tells me flat out no. And sometimes he just says, yeah, fine, go ahead. And when he tells me I can go someplace and I go to that place, there's, there's, there's good things that happen and it's fruitful. Mother Nadine told the story once that they asked the Lord about everything. Uh, they wanted to go out and they needed a car, so they went out and found the car, the right color and price and everything like that. And then she realized we never asked the Lord if we if he wanted us to get a car. So they just stopped looking for it and they went back and asked him. And then he told them, Yeah, I do want you to get a car. Okay. Does that sound does that sound the crazy way to learn? Or do you think that, that there might be a new way to learn? It's, it's the only way. It's the there. only. It really is, because you know, I, who was it? Saint Saint Bernard uh, said the only thing that burns in hell is self will, and if you die with no self will, there's nothing to burn. You know, we're supposed to be let it done on earth as it is in heaven. Sounds to me like we'd have more of heaven on earth if we would give up our self will. 
That doesn't mean we don't make we don't. That doesn't mean we don't make decisions and don't use our rational mind and intellect and common sense. Those those are gifts too. But when I get to those things where I know that I'm about to exercise my self will again, and I get get ahead of Jesus over here, or I go in the morning, part of my morning offering, and I says, "Lord Jesus, go before us today. Let your glory be my regard, our regard. May your angel encamp around on us to deliver us." May you fill us and every person we meet with your Holy Spirit. And I start getting out there. I say, I'm sorry, Lord, I asked you to go before me today. And here I'm trying to get out in front of you again. Okay? And I know you'll let me do it, but I don't want to do it anymore. I was just doing it. I didn't even know what I was doing. I didn't even know what I was doing. But the Spirit came in and shone some light on it. And I says, you know what you're really doing? This is what you're really doing. I said, oh, God, I didn't know that. Well, all these years, I didn't know I was doing that. But he's patient, he loves us so much, and he's bringing us around. And what is he doing? He's just waking us up. So that we could be, what? He says, I'm the light of the world. Then what does he say to us? You're the light of the world. Can you imagine that? You're the light of the world. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. As I'm in the Father, and the Father's in me, I'm in you, and you're in me, said Jesus. And we believe that Jesus lives in our hearts by faith, right? We believe Jesus lives in our hearts by faith. The one that spoke the universe into existence. And yet, I get upset because I got stuff going on I don't know what to do with. He told me one time, a long time ago, many, many years when I was fussing about something. I always had fussy periods about stuff, and I just was worrying about something. And uh, he spoke to my heart. He said, uh, he said, Frank, you think the stars are going to collide tonight? I said, no, sir, they never collided. If they did, you know, we're done. Do you think that the sun's not going to rise in the morning? It's always risen. If it doesn't, that's the end of human history. He says, if I can do all that stuff, don't you think I can take care of your stuff? I said, yes, sir. I put my head on the pillow and went to sleep. And I woke up in the morning and I was just freed from whatever that foolishness I was clouded over. It's clouds come in, you know. Yes. So we're going to continue to do this. We're going to let it be known that we're going to do this. Uh, again, the, the third uh, Wednesday, uh, we're going to just have to do it after, after adoration because I think it's important to participate in that, and we're just going to do that. And again, the 26th of March to April 11th, I'm going to be out of the country, so we won't have very many visits. So what we're going to do now then is together, all of us, Temples of the Holy Spirit are going to focus our, fix our eyes on Jesus, and we're going to ask Him now for the grace for whatever we need for healing. And and we have two chairs. Somebody can sit in this chair, this chair. Uh, maybe a couple of you can help come up and help me pray. But healing could be I got a physical problem. Healing could be I'm stressed. Healing could be. Um, I've got some emotional things going in. I've got an a relational thing I need. I might be in a financial situation where I need a breakthrough. I need to trust that God's going to provide for me. There's lots of kinds of healing within us. It might be, I know you're calling me to do something. And like me, for many years, he said he was calling me to do some things that I just, I couldn't wrap my arms around it. It was just too big for me to conceive of. Not me. Don't you know who I am? And you say, I know who you are. I'm going to get you to the point where you're going to know who you really are. See, I thought it was somebody else. People told me who I should be. That don't work. I am who God tells me who I am. That's why I do 16 scriptures every morning about what God tells me who I am. To remind myself not to be an idiot. <laughs> I can be there. I can go there fast. We can take we can go down that side alley real fast. Okay? So Lord, I'm gonna just put I'm just gonna put a little bit of music down. And if you want to go over to prayer, you don't have to say, you can tell me what you want to pray for, or you don't have to tell me what you pray for. It doesn't matter. We're really relying on the Holy Spirit right now. One of the good things I found out is it says in the scriptures, David made his complaint unto the Lord. So I often ask people, just while we're praying, just tell Jesus either in your mind or you can say with your lips, whatever you want, this is what I need. This is what I want. I'm asking you, Lord, to help me. And before we do that, we're just going to say, and you can repeat after me, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus I accept you, I accept you into, my life more deeply. into my life. 
Thank you that you've forgiven my sins. Thank you that you've forgiven my sins. Thank you, Jesus, that you're the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, you're the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. I'm asking you right now, Lord, to fill me more deeply with the Holy Spirit than ever. going to be Jesus doing it through the Holy Spirit because the bodies get come together in unity of heart and mind and each one of us has the Holy Spirit that's flowing through us and that river flowing through you and me and everybody else is going to combine together and that's God's going to then do whatever he wants he's going to confirm his word the word through signs and wonders this is all glory to God. It's got nothing to do with the individual person. It's got to do with the love of God. So, who wants to pray? Sir, come on. Thank you, Jesus.
So continue to just thank him for whatever graces that have come down on you tonight. And we ask that the same grace that fell on all of us tonight would fall on all those that normally meet with us that couldn't be with us upon all our family members, all the members in our community, all the people we work with, all those in authority, Lord, that they would exercise authority properly. And the church said, Amen. 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 Right? Just say yes. <laughs> Just say yes.